scientist, a conventional physicist. I'm at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and I'm one of the uh, collaborators uh, within this uh, project. Yeah. Uh, so here's the outline. I will briefly do uh, an introduction, and uh, then will describe uh, about the uh, the model construction, because for any computation, you need a model in order to do the calculation. So I will briefly um, describe the computational methods that we use. And, uh, so most of my time will be spent on the uh, section four and five. Uh, four is the electronic structure. Uh, and the bonding in the DNA models, which also including uh, the results on the optical properties or that electric function that is necessary for this project. Then I will spend some time on the simulation on the DNA alpha stretching, which is a computational experiment of pulling apart a DNA double strand. I would probably end up on some conclusions and uh, mention something on the alpha uh, for the future. Yeah. <clears throat> so everybody knows uh, DNA is the mother of all life science and the nanotechnology. And the DNA is uh, what is the, the nucleic acid containing all the genetic uh, information of all the non-living organisms. <laughs> And the DNA segment carrying this particular information is called the genes. So everybody knows that uh, if you wanted to live long, the most important factor is your genes from your parents, not necessarily you know, how much exercise or how you control your diet. And the genes are the most important factor. DNA consists of uh, two long polymers uh, of simple units, nucleotides, with big bones, which are made of sugar, and uh, phosphate groups. So uh, this uh, double helix structure was first uh, proposed by Watson and Crick, everybody knows that, in the 1953 Nature paper, based on the x ray Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, based on the um, X-ray diffraction data, but actually before that, there have been many uh, earlier works by other founders. Now we are more interested not in the life science, but uh, essentially in the nanotechnology. DNA has been viewed as a functional material far more than the genetic information carried by DNA. And the DNA was suggested as early as in 1962 to serve as an electronic conductor or molecular wires um, in the early 1962. So actually, uh, there are a lot of papers uh, recently, uh, uh, people working on the molecular uh, conductance of the DNA actually uh, I still have been reviewing one of the paper, which is our video on the uh, molecular uh, conductivity. So here's uh, some uh, uh, sketch about uh, uh, the BDNA. Essentially, you have uh, four base pairs called ATGC. I think these are the information most of people are very familiar. What but does I, the B stand for, please? B is. Uh, different type of DNA, and the most common is the B DNA. So there are A DNA, Z DNA, and the A was the A was what Watson and Crick or those people studied, and it's the dry one, which doesn't have the helix. And the second form found was called B, and that is an aqueous solution, has the helical structure. Thank yeah. you. So this is probably the simplest structure. They had to dry it to see the pictures at first, they didn't realize that it might be 2% well, if you the humidity below that, it changes the helical tension. So we have the B, because it, we learned that afterwards, studying solutions. The A and the B is a human thing, what was seen first. But it was the artifact of drawing for the early pictures that they called now A. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yeah. So, so these are the uh, two uh, base uh, pairs, A, T, and G, C. A always pairs um, with T, and the G always pairs with C. And uh, in the in the A T pair, there are Hardy bounds uh, between two Hardy bounds between the base pair, and the control the most important interactions. And <coughs> between G and C, there are three Hardy bounds which interact. Uh, um, uh, <coughs> very importantly. So these are the big bonds, uh, consist of the uh, PO4 group and also the sugar uh, group. So these are the uh, schematic diagrams and we can look at them in a slightly different way and uh, there are some uh, chemical formulas and one of these four base pairs also called the residues, AT and GC. I will not go into detail. And uh, another uh, figure which is a little bit more uh, detailed is that this is a double helix. You can see many of the sculptures in the, some of the gardens and so on, sometimes uh, with these type of pictures. And there again, those are the base pairs uh, connected by the hard bonds. And there are interactions between the sugar and uh, also the, uh, the phosphates. And again, this is uh, for base pairs. The important thing is uh, we will talk about a lot is uh, A always pair with T and C always pair with G and we will have two models to be constructed. And uh, the important thing is that there are two hydrogen bonds between A and T and three hydrogen bonds between C and G. And all this to be, need to be modeled. So this is a very brief introduction. So the next thing that I will describe is how to construct a model that we can do the calculation. Yeah. <coughs> so the model is constructed by creating using a nuclear acid builder and uh, <coughs> as the starting point. Then we using what we call the NBAC program, which is a very, very popular uh, program used by <coughs> Uh, DNA researchers, and uh, I think uh, it is uh, created uh, uh, it's a big program I mean, from UC uh, University of California, uh, San Diego, San Francisco, I can't remember. And uh, using the NBAC program, we were imposing the periodic city in the Z direction, or the, called the actual direction. Then next, we will add sodium ions one per PO4 group because the PO4 group is negatively charged and in order to simulate the BDNA in a solution that we would put the sodium atom close to the PO4 group as the counter ions to balance the charge. Then we use another very popular package called WASP which is a Vienna initial simulation package very popular in the condensed matter theory, or you can use similar force-related program to fully relax the structure, because you need to make sure your sodium ions and others are fully relaxed in order to do the calculation to be reasonably accurate. So we actually build two such models, periodic models. We will label it as AT10 and CG10. AT10 means there are 10 base pairs, in, in the uh, uh, periodically in the z direction, and the CG10 means that there are base pairs between C and G. So these are the uh, two models uh, we build and uh, try to study them. Of course, you can build additional models with the next pairs or with even longer uh, periodicity. So the double helix structure is described by six parameters. The first is the shift in the AB plane perpendicular to the helix axis, the stacking height, the twist angle, and the tilt or the low angle phi and the omega. <coughs> and uh, the periodicity is imposed in the actual direction, which we will consider to be the C direction which will reduce the number of free parameters. So we will particularly sort of focus on the AT model in this talk. The twist 
angle is 36 degrees, that means after 10 base pairs, you will just return to the original position because uh, 360 degrees is just uh, uh, one round of the angle. And well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Um, how easy is it to go to other forms of the energy? Let's say you want to do triple helix or quadruple helix. How easy would it be to modify? Your uh, it's not easy, but no, it's, it's doable. It's doable. It's doable. Yeah. And uh, because uh, in all computational um, calculations, the model building is the first step and the most essential step. Without any reliable model, any calculation will be useless. That's why we spend a lot of time to build the right model first. After that, the actual com calculation is actually not that difficult because you already have the tools ready. You already test it's only you require a humongous amount of computer. So I would say it is possible, but it's not easy. <laughs> it would take time. You know? So we are focusing on the anti ten model, which you have a twist angle of 36 degrees. 36 times 10 is 360 degrees, one circle. Okay? And the A replies shift the uh, reduced to one helix, which the, uh, in the radius of the, uh, I will show the figure very soon, uh, about this uh, double helix. And, uh, and then you have for uh, the stacking height of about 3.3 uh, Armstrong after fully relaxed. Now you put this uh, sort of double helix in a box because everything has to be periodic. So you have A and B spacing actually taken to be 30 times 30 Armstrong large. So you would considering just the double helix of the model. You do not consider the interactions between the D and the strands. If you make them too small, then those uh, two double oh, strands are intact. Interactions between two double strands. Exactly. Not between strands exactly. within a single. Yeah. Yeah. And you want them to be reasonably large, but not a huge. You can put it 100 to 100, but that will just increase your cost, and uh, it's not necessary. So 30 by 30 uh, separation is, is good enough. So this model, we call the AT10, has a total of 660 atoms you know, in the formula. It's uh, written like this. And it can be organized into five called functional groups. You know, one is the sugar, you have 20 sugars, you have 10 on the one strand sugar, another 10 in the, uh, the second strand, you have the phosphates, you have a PO4, 20 of them, you know, 10 for each of the uh, uh, strand in A and T, and uh, then you have a 20 solid to counterbalance the PO4 group, and then you have the two bases, which is the A and T. So each of them have 10 of this, uh, and so you have uh, 10 base pairs, 80. So here's the figure of the model constructed. So this is the unit cell. Uh, now may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what about the water? Do you have a water around it? No. It's the no, dry. What's the epsilon then? Huh? Epsilon of interaction. I mean, the interaction between the charge. What epsilon? Yeah, is that is the reason to put sodium there, to, to, to move no, no, no. the sodium. Yeah, but, but sodium sodium interaction. Sodium sodium interaction, it is all covered, you know, if there are interactions, they are included. Okay? Because this is an initial calculation. Yes. Yeah. But so, it's with epsilon. Epsilon vacuum. 1 or epsilon 8? Right. If there's no water, it's vacuum. Yeah, it's a vacuum. Right. Yeah. Everything is smashed. So this DNA has the structure it would have in water, but there is no explicit water present. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. but, but in calculation, you have to somehow modify this epsilon mm -hmm. in order to fix it. Yeah, so this is entirely a model. It's not say it is the real DNA or what is the <coughs> Now this eventually is it possible to add water? It is possible. 
faster than that. But, but how long? Cost. How cost? Yeah. How cost? <laughs> and this is actually part of the discussion that we need to go. From your cartoon, we are to understand the purple dots, the sodium, are sitting in one place near each phosphate. Is yes. Correct? You see, it's crystallographically located in that sense of being structured here in the city. Um, there's because no this, double layer. There's no diffuse layer. Okay. So, so let me say this. Initially, we put a just sodium close to the PO4 and uh, you know, reasonably close. But after fully relaxed them, then sodium is to be moving around. This is the relaxed structure. You can see they become very symmetrical, you know, very beautiful. And this is actually we got about four or five years ago. You know. I was uh, rather shocked because I thought that the sodium would be just jumping and moving around a little bit. So it actually seems to be very, very symmetric. Maybe that is uh, because your bearing length is very, very high. And all of them just condense on phosphates. They could be. Uh. So this is the model. So if you this is the periodic in the z direction. So you have uh, ten base pairs. You know this is uh, one base pair to one, two, three, four, five, six, to ten. So this this layer is the same as this layer because it's a periodic. So here's the summary of this uh, um, AT10 model, and uh, we build a similar uh, data for the uh, CG10 model, which. You, because the base pair is slightly different and it's a little bit smaller, 650 atoms, uh, but it for three hydrogen bonds across the base. So I finished about the model itself. So the next thing I will briefly mention the computational methods uh, that we used. You know. What happened? So uh, for the model construction and relaxation, I already mentioned that we use the WASP package, which is the plan web based method using pseudo potentials. It's a very popular package used uh, by us mainly for the structural optimization for the mechanical and elastic properties calculations. And, uh, uh, and uh, so by doing the theoretical experiment, on the second part, I will mention a little bit about uh, this alpha stretching. Uh, so this is used in my WASP. For the property an analysis, we use uh, the, uh, called the orthogonal analysis linear combination of atomic orbital methods. This is a method that they developed in my own laboratory. And uh, this use the atomic waves uh, for the uh, <coughs> use atomic waves for the expansion, and uh, uh, which is uh, consists of Gaussians for the basis expansion. This is mainly used for the electronic structure and the bonding calculation, density of state, and the partial density of states, the effective charge calculation, the optical <coughs> and spectroscopic properties calculation. The Zenith and the Airless Edge calculations, I will give examples for some of these results. So both WASP and OSCO are density functional theory based methods. So this is at the level of density functional theory, it is not at the level of many body theory. Okay. So the combination of these two methods are most effective are for computational research in uh, <laughs> complex materials. <clears throat> so now I would uh, uh, concentrate on the electronic structure and the bonding in the DNA models that, uh, based on uh, our calculation. <clears throat> so I mentioned about a little bit about uh, using the OSCO method. Because uh, um, from the self-consistent electronic structure calculation, by solving the standard Schrodinger equation based on density of <coughs> functional theory, we obtain the energy eigenvalues and wave functions as the main R. So all the calculation 
is try to get the energy eigenvalues and the wave functions. So this, from this calculation, uh, what gives us the important output is the energy eigenvalue and the wave functions. So from this, we can obtain the important quantities, which are the density of states and the group resolved partial density of states. I will talk about the density of state a little bit later, which is the same as the <coughs> energy levels, or how to count them. Yeah. And the more important thing that in any other quantum chemistry is the homonormal gap. That means that you, in solid state physics, you call it a band gap. For quantum chemistry, you call it a homonormal gap. Homo means the highest occupied molecular orbital. Lumo is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. The more important thing, uh, in my own opinion, is the calculation of the effective charge and the bond order values. Effective charge is from the wave function and this alpha level matrix based on the molecular analysis scheme that will give you the effective charge on each atom. Those are quantum mechanical results. The bound order values give you how strong is the bond between a pair of atoms. And uh, most people would sort of use the bond, estimate the bond strength by just the, the distance of separation. And this is uh, actually not accurate enough because this is a quantum mechanical calculation. The bound order also depends on the immediate environment of the pair of the atoms. So we can also obtain the hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen and the oxygen, or hydrogen and the nitrogen. It turns out the hydrogen bonding, of course, is much weaker than the covalent bond, but they are extremely important in our molecular systems. And the most important to our project would be the calculation of the dielectric constant, which is a frequency dependent imaginary part of the dielectric constant, which you have to obtain from the wave functions imposing the energy conservation law. And from this imaginary part, you use chronic Kramer's relation to get the real part. I, I see the R dependence explicitly in Yes, those are integrated by R. This is R is inter integrated R? Yeah, this is uh, where the the, the integration... Uh, so it's just integral over k? Uh, integrate of uh, the breathing zone. Actually, this is a little bit of... I used this formula actually from the crystal. Uh, actually, this is uh, only one k point uh, for a large model, so it's integrated. Uh, yes, it is. One of the greatest successes I've had in my life was convincing Roger to use the word coefficient instead of constant. <laughs> It was, it was a tough sell when we got there. When you call this an optical dielectric constant, I think you really want us to be thinking in terms of the frequency dependent on the function. Ah, dielectric what function. What kind of a frequency range should we be talking about? So we are talking about the optical dielectric function. Yes. You are not the constant. Right. And the constant y is equal to zero. Yeah. Right. So we are thinking about the, the aim is to get the entire spectrum. Yes, yeah. yeah. starting basically at optical frequency. Why is this a cultural bias? Because our eyes are working there, or is it because this is where the important behavior is? Actually, all the calculations are frequency dependent. This is a whole thing. And you will see it. Okay, but you're really talking about the four, you're going from zero frequency, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Before I come here, I actually read through uh, my slides and this sort of uh, the thing I didn't uh, catch and I should have used. No, but I'm asking in real life now, where's the range that we should be thinking about here? Uh, I think that realistically, uh, about the, from zero to about 30 EV, far Okay, away. so really the whole thing. Okay. So uh, let me go back to my question. Uh, R. Is it possible to get R dependent epsilon? Because no, uh, no. Fifteen years ago, Roja was doing this uh, grain boundary thing. Wanted me to do that. Marshall after the Think that about it for a year is not possible. Why is that not possible? I don't know. Um, you can you can 
build their models into the different regions of R and uh, to draw the local one by one of different regions. Uh, it's, because it's, let's, it's, say, let's say that you have a stacked base pairs, which are not the same, yeah. and then you measure your epsilon here or here, it's going to be different. Except experiment, but uh, computationally, you are doing the whole thing. You are doing the whole thing. I'm not so saying it's impossible. Kind of I don't know how to do it. It's a kind of an average, spatial average. It's a linear model. What your calculation, what this calculation does is what if I see your initial structure, your model is what your result is. If you wanted to have a different R uh, or different configurations, then you build a different models to do that. <coughs> When you, when you say the R dependence, is this uh, the very how the epsilon varies within the DNA, in the DNA? Yes, that is what he means. Anywhere or outside of it? That would be actually a very, very important part. I thought it for a long time because we, Roger and I discussed about this point uh, many times, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's still ways we could do this. We could work on it. But uh, there may be clever ways you can do it. I haven't thought about it. Maybe it's in the very derivation of this formula that uh, we should take this into account. It's somewhere. It occurred, but the derivation of formula and actually practically you can obtain the spectrum are two different things. We might put this on our do list and just at least touch on this. Yes. So here's the density of states of these two models, AT and CG. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, this one is a homo homo gas on a 2.91 EV. And this CG model has a homo lumo gap of 2.62. So for molecular systems, the quantum chemists we're using a bunch of horizontal lines to show your energy levels. And they will have a homo level, lumo level, and then it will be a homo lumo. In condensed matter physics, we use the density of states, which is uh, originated from the band theory. So the density of state is the number of states per unit energy per unit set. So DOS and POS display contain a lot more information than the figure is. So essentially, you have a large number of peaks. Essentially, this is the energy level, energy level. And some of them are very close to each other. You know? And uh, so you can break them down into from which group it comes from. I, last week, I actually did some search. There are some calculations uh, uh, some time ago. Uh, by H1 in the physical evaluators, which give a band gap value of 2.74 for AT and 2.0 for CG. And they uh, use a method <laughs> which is called a fireball code, which is a non-self-consistent calculation. And uh, of course, uh, in my biased opinion, that our calculation is a lot more accurate than that there was reported at that When time. was that reported? 2002. Because I think there's more work, uh, also experimental work, people measure. In the, in the, in the course, yes. yeah, I haven't had the... We need to explore this. Yeah, we need to explore. But this is already shown that I uh, use the model cross, that means mm -hmm. AT will have a larger than the gap than the C. And so, the behavior across that gap depends only on the width of the gap and not so much on the details of the occupied I think uh, for the optical, uh, for the optical calculations, uh, the band gap is the most important. That will dominate. You don't have to worry about the, what, what it looks like on either side for the density. No, you, you need because if you go back to the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. This, is the, this is the occupied and an occupied state. Yes, so this is the, uh, the momentum matrix, uh, the square of the momentum matrix uh, for the golden rule in the, for the optical transition. So, so this uh, both are very important, and I will come to that point uh, very quickly. Okay. 
So before I go to the optical properties, I would show that this is the partial density of states for the AT10. We can divide them into five functional groups. Yeah. In the convex matter physics, we will usually will break down the partial dens uh, density of states from which type of the atoms? So all from carbon, all from nitrogen, all from oxygen. But in the power molecular systems, the important thing is to break them down into the different groups. You know, you are from the T and the A, from sugar, from PO4, and from the sodium. You can see sodium for almost all the it is, uh, states in the uh, in the conduction band, because the sodium electron charge, one electron is almost all uh, sort of transferred into the other uh, pure form. Yeah. And you can see the homo states, highest orbital, mo <coughs> highest molecular orbital states, are from the base pairs A and T, and the lumo states are mostly from pure form sodium, yeah, and uh, also from the sugar. So the important thing is that the unoccupied states up to five EV, say something those states, um, have full contributions from both sugar and the base pairs. So this is where the com uh, complication comes. Uh, so there differ a spectacular difference in the optical properties, and it's the root of its anisotropy. Yeah. So we will show these results um, in the next slide. So sugar and base pairs, yes, are primary for anisotropic problems. Yeah, but uh, there are also the interaction between A and T. So everything is actually involved here. So sugar and base pairs. Yeah. And uh, so the other calculation, which I will not show CG10, is uh, kind of rather similar results. So one thing that uh, that the OSU method can give you is uh, what we call the effective charge. And then in some other people's language, it's called a partial charge. And this is quite important. There are six atomic species in the BBNA model, which is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, hydrogen, and we added the sodium as a compound ions. And uh, they have a mutual atomic charge. You know, so Carbon have four electrons, uh, nitrogen five, oxygen six, and uh, phosphorus five, and uh, sodium and hydrogen each have one. So this is, uh, so you have one, four, five, six. So here's the calculated charge uh, for all these uh, 660 atoms. And uh, you can see, uh, this is a very useful information because the difference between this calculated effective charge, I'm going to start, and the neutral atom charge, which is uh, uh, the neutral atom, and uh, this gives the partial charge, or we call it charge transfer for each atom. So you can see that the carbon can gain or lose charge above or below for depending on the local bonding configuration. But hydrogen and sodium always have to give up charge or lose charge. Mm -hmm. Sodium almost give up all its charge. And, uh, and the, the nitrogen and the oxygen always gain charge. So now you can see phosphorus is actually <laughs> always a loss charge because it is connected as PO4. You have to consider PO4 rather than phosphorus as an atom. So this is the AT10, this is the CD10. They have a similar characteristic. Got it. I'm make sure I'm, this is important. I want to see, make sure I'm reading this correctly. If I see a zero for sodium, it means it's given up the electron. All the electrons. But it's not exactly. Everything's yet. measured, everything's in measured in numbers of electrons. Not all the electrons. So if I see that the ion is a pure positive species, that would be dead zero on that graph. Yes. It, that's the way I'm looking at it. And then you're saying we should notice that in fact when we have phosphate, the oxygens have pulled the electrons out. Okay. But you're looking at a net 
Chuck. So how do I read that phosphate? I'm just trying to see one. You know, how many still... negatives are left on the phosphate? Is three instead of four? I don't. How do I read that? Okay. Three? So 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 this is three because you have a PO4. So oxygen actually have a, have some charges. Yeah. You know, I mean, so if you consider I should plot this instead of P, I probably should plot this as PO4. Then you actually would uh, be a very uh, would, uh, would be a very different number. You actually uh, you know that, that you know I let me see this is the, it it uh, sort of uh, give more electrons to the to the phosphor. So the whole PO4 uh, would not be uh, what should be the number of electrons to the source? You have the six. Well, there's one or two ionizations. And yeah. You usually speak of one or two, and then you give oxygen to it, it's 6.5. And I'm trying to get the arithmetic in this thing. So let us say you put an average is 6.5. You have about uh, five, uh, half of the electron. So you have a four, then you have two of them for the PO4. And uh, then you add two, three, they give you five. This is in. PO4 and uh, it's probably have to be um, more than that so you can account for the, the charge transfer from the soul. I I should have to flick them down to the not the phosphorus, but instead the PO4. Those informations are all there in the data. It's just uh, you know take a bit of time to uh, to assemble them because mm -hmm. in the in the the solid state crystals we also do on the atomic basis in the biomolecular systems is the functional group that is important. So that's what I'm saying here. We can add delta Q for partial charge for each of the functional groups. Mm -hmm. You can add them up to the A base A or T or A and T or sugar or PO4 or PO4 plus sodium. But uh, this figure, I didn't do that. It's uh, take, uh, quite some time you know, uh, to do this kind of thing. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, what's the physical meaning of a partial charge? Is that, it is my understanding that if you don't want to go into details of quantum mechanical calculations, but if you want to have these cost grain simulations, when you have just phosphate group, counter ions, water, then probably for that type of simulation, you have to take these partial charges. So this is exactly that we try to know of the amino acids for the protein work. So in some of the uh, course paper, uh, your figures you have for different amino acids, you have different, different cups, some positively charged, some negatively charged. So actually, one way we hope we do not know yet, you know, if we can add them up, you know, some of the amino acid hopefully will show what uh, what you are uh, supposed to see. But I have no idea how the experimentalists or you know, people know how much charge some particular amino acid in the protein. Here I can only say quantum mechanically by doing this charge calculation, you can sort the things out and give a quantitative number. You know, and, uh, you know, I dig out the, those results within the last two weeks in preparation for this talk. So the only figure I can make is these two, but it would be nice to break them down into the functional groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are these these numbers are like matching with the a number of electrons in the in the outer in the outer, uh, most outer shell of these atoms, right? Yeah, those are atoms. Now these numbers are you have six hundred sixty atoms in 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 your model. Okay. So this is the carbon, this is the hydrogen, this no. is the nitrogen. You know, I think I don't understand the figures still, but the carbon has six electrons and the effective charge is four. No, 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 because uh, the carbon, uh, the outer shell is outer shell, four, right? yeah, four, four. So we are only electrons. talking about outer shell. Yeah, right? sure. You know, you don't talk about the, 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 the electrons. electrons. It does play no role, okay? 
This would count as the valence electrons and watching how they redistribute. And so oxygen has six electrons in the outer shell. Yes. And why is it going a little bit up, like 6.5 in the carbon? Because carbon it's the gain electrons. In the PL4 group. Okay. In the PL4 group. Okay. 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 So. You know, phosphorus is, uh, is a different species. You know. it's, it has uh, five electrons, but actually it will be less electron. Uh, and uh, uh, phosphorus uh, is, uh, is uh, quite different. Now, nitrogen and uh, oxygen are always considered to be electronegative. Electronegative means you have more electron than the neutral. Now, some people define it in the opposite direction with a negative sign, and uh, this actually causes a lot of confusion. So every time where I Present something, we have to make sure this is the number of electrons. So I would say oxygen gain charge, then this is more negative. Yes, should the, should the side of the effective charge for the sodium be opposite then? Yeah, but it depends on how you define it. You know, I already said this. I define it as an atom which is missing one electron. Yeah, you can define the way you, you like. There are other people define things slightly different. You know, and that sometimes cause a lot of confusion in the literature. So if I'm going to try to remember what you're saying, for security, I will go to the carbon. Yeah. And I'll say those are reliably four because of the tetrahedral symmetry, and most of the time it's sharing the electrons sort of fairly between each neighbor. Is this, is this a good way to remember? Yeah, yeah, because the carbon sometimes lose charge and they sometimes gain charge because in the DNA and in many other uh, biological systems, the, the bonding of carbon, sometimes you can have a double bond, sometimes you know, it bound to the oxygen, so it could be very different. In diamond, the carbon would be rock solid four. Exactly. And that's a good reference. Then we start yes. to think deviations from that. Is that a exactly. good reference? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. What, what's the difference between the effective charge and the Mulkin population? Can I use the Mulkin population at the. Monica Pabea, those are calculated from the Monica analysis. Mm -hmm. So this. Uh, yeah, this uh, you can say the Monica, um, this is the Monica population, Monica charge. So if the, another way of calling effective charge is uh, called Murakan effective charge. It means your calculation is based on the Murakan analysis. Is, is, is mm -hmm. that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now here's the most important thing. So here's the directionally solved optical properties of these two models, AT10 and CT10. So Adrian, to answer your questions, this calculation went up to 40 million. So the top panel is the total dielectric uh, function, not the dielectric constant, dielectric function. So this is the x component, this is the y component, and this is the z component. So now you can see x component and y component is almost identical. But the z component is entirely different. This is the same situation in the CD10 because you have a cylindrical structure of your model. And uh, I can put this figure in uh, this form. Which One is, question, Wayne. Yeah. How are the x and y axes divided? x, y x is the kind of thing you have a 30 Armstrong by 30 Armstrong with your BDNA model in the middle. But PDNA, you can turn around. Yes, you can turn so, around, but you do not have to. This is the entire model calculated. I know, but it's, it's not R resolved, not the new understand, system. but you can define X and, X and Y different. It doesn't matter, because they are the same. I call it the planner, OK? Mm -hmm. So there's this figure is about. This planner means X plus Y divided by two, OK? And uh, then this is the CG10, and then you can see it's entirely different from the actual direction, which is the Z direction. You can see all these peaks is come in the planar direction, which the base pair impacts. And you can also see that the AT and the CG 
are actually not the same. Now, this is very important. If my calculation is very crude, A, T, and C, D are almost the same, then you can never differentiate their difference between the base pairs. Then our project may have a problem, <laughs> right? And so you can see this is uh, extremely important because they are very, very different. You know, so the difference in the anisotropy between AT10 and CT10 be, uh, below the 9 EV, you know, is, is very different, uh, quite different. And uh, the absolute value of epsilon 2 depends on the size of the simulation set. So that's the thing that I mentioned to you, we need to think about the normalization because this number is actually very important. And it depends on your cell size. Yeah. So the normalization is very important. Uh, the most important thing out of these results are instead showing the optical differences between AT10 and CG10 and the strong optical anisotropy. Yes. And with the experimental optical properties that we will measure, it becomes rather straightforward to normalize and check that we're all making sense. And on the other hand, this peak is also quite important because mm -hmm. these are the broad main peak around 14 EV. This is a common to most of the, all the other organic polymers. Yeah. This peak is always there. Right? Mm -hmm. And it, only these ones I can turn this stick to the particular uh, AT or CG or in the DNA. Can you say it again, what's the problem with normalization? Where does it fit? The normalization is because uh, your, you know, we have the same thing in the common energy. You remember that. But uh, I think it can be, it can be, there is a way that you can, uh, you can normalize. Because for example, uh, one way we can do is to, from this, <coughs> this uh, epsilon, curve, you convert it to the epsilon 1, then you can get the refractive index. Yeah. If some of you can measure it, then you can add in a, some kind of a, a normalization factor to make them the same as the measured refractive index that all your epsilon 1, epsilon 2 would be. So give up an effect. Normalization means a factor. A factor, a numerical factor. Which is the same for all energies. Yes. So this let's just look at the clock to make sure we can finish the seminar and we can leave some of these detailed discussions for later. Okay. So this, uh, this is another thing, but I said that this is an unexplored area. It turns out that our method can do the uh, then the spectral calculation are uh, actually then the spectra is the core level excitation. Uh, it's a characterization technique. You can consider the nitrogen spectra from one S level to the unoccupied level, and uh, you can. Uh, and this is uh, in the biological system. This is a, a very unexplored area because. You can actually, you know, you can see the nitrogen have this very local different thing. Some of them very similar, like this nitrogen, this nitrogen, and this nitrogen and uh, this nitrogen, but these two are very different. So this, uh, I happen to be able to do such calculations, so I'll use an example, but this is not important and irrelevant to what we are supposed to do. And uh, I would uh, skip out. Very quickly, our time is uh, up and uh, not up, uh, very limited. Uh, I will go through very quickly about the simulation on DNA of our stretching. Mm -hmm. This is actually a quite interesting work. This is the work uh, done by um, part of the um, PhD dissertation of my student, Lillian. Um, so uh, essentially, we have this. Uh, DNA model, pan base pair, we pull them apart until they are free. Okay, so that's what we did. And this is a, a very, very active area, you know, a lot of experimental work, and uh, so essentially people have many uh, theories, and uh, you might ask, uh, they, are called, they try to explore the force and uh, of the extension curve, and the, the current understanding, very controversial, you know, 
Uh, you put the DNA apart, there are uh, sort of uh, six uh, different uh, uh, stages. You know, the, the region one is essentially called elastic control. The second part is elastic extension. You are extending the, um, the DNA. And the most important one is this uh, called the transition control of, of a force around 65 piconewton. And then after that, uh, you know, you, you transform into different type of DNA called the sDNA, and then you have the building of the DNA, then you have the, uh, sort of elastic extension of the single strand and until it breaks and so forth. So we, I found it will be quite cool, so I asked Greg to explore into this area. And uh, by purely computational experiment, and, uh, uh, this is a very controversial area. I'm not going into the detail. Many of the uh, papers there are just very quickly. Uh, I think I should uh, sort of uh, just go through the slide without uh, going into the detail. And uh, if any of you feel interested, uh, I can I'm still here for several days. So what we are doing is this is your starting of the model. You pull them step by step apart until some of them start to break. And uh, you know, and uh, at a different stage, try to correlate what the experimental uh, people are observed. You know, you can see at the some sugar, the carbon carbon bond, and the sugar part start to break first. And uh, so we sort of monitoring the total energy of the simulation. Uh, and uh, at a certain point, you can divide into different regions. The total energy will either drop, uh, drop uh, very uh, clearly. And, uh, and another thing is will drip that there are some little kinks. All this has the meaning. So you can monitor the distance of D1 and D2 in the backbone and see how they change in the A or T and T. And uh, for the, these two um, uh, distances, D1 and D2, these are the distance D1, so just the carbon-carbon distance between the sugar, and the D2 is the other uh, distance between uh, including <coughs> the, the PO4. And uh, so you know, eventually your data start to, uh, to sort of break a certain uh, extension. And you can also try to see how the dihedral angle changes as you pull the DNA. And uh, you can also get how the hydrogen bonding changes, the hydrogen bond distance, and the hydrogen bond bond the other. And these are very interesting results. Uh, I don't think anybody has ever studied this type of thing before. It can also show there from the charge transfer to see what happens and where it happens um, when you uh, sort of pull that uh, DNA model. It turns out that uh, this, uh, this hatched area, as you pull the DNA, actually the strand A loss charge and the strand T gain charge. Those can be all put in the quantitative way. So here is uh, something about the link opening reaction uh, for in the near the end. And at the end, the, 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 the sugar will start to, to, to break up. And I'm not going to the detail. And uh, from the electronic structure point of view, you can also calculate all the total density of states and functionally solve the uh, partial density of states to see how they are evolved when you uh, pull the DNA apart. So this is the summary. I will not go into it. And uh, again, this is the summary about the uh, alpha stretching uh, and part of the work. So this is uh, secondary importance, even though it's very interesting. So now I'm going to get across to the conclusion. Conclusion means the conclusion of what we did. So this is a little bit important. <laughs> the conclusion of the initial BN, BDNA simulation, I think we started the work about the, in 2006. I cannot remember except. You know. Since 2006, when we started to do the research on the DNA model, 
It's purely a curiosity driven, and I just want to test our method, our capabilities. Nobody gives us any money or anything, you know, and uh, so we have accomplished actually quite a lot. First, we build the periodic models, two of them, ten base pair, AT10 and CG. And this model can be the basis of further studies. We calculate the electronic structure using the OSCR method. And the most relevant to what we are doing right now is that it calculates the optical properties which show large and isotropy in the actual and in the planar direction. And we also explore the effect of alpha stretching of this particular model AT10, which I skipped through because of the time constraint. So this results produce the basis for further studies in the DNA-related biomolecular systems. <clears throat> so I will spend just uh, a few seconds or a few minutes on the alpha rock for the future. <clears throat> I think uh, this is a rather uh, long list. You know. uh, the whole conclusion is there's a plenty of opportunities. Uh, we already know nanobiology, uh, uh, <coughs> our technology is here, and but understanding the principles of the complex bioprocess on the cooperations of various components of DNA, proteins, molecules, and their environmental effects of solvents and ions. So this is the demonstration is uh, basically the convergence of the lab science, physical science, computer science, and engineering. Yeah. And uh, it is very apparent that our initial modeling would be a very powerful tool uh, in this journey of combining them together. And of course, the advances uh, in the computational modeling achieve we use a uh, huge amount of supercomputer time has opened a huge door for such endeavors. Actually, in the recent years, you can see all the funding agencies are start to funding their computational researches. Yeah. And I think this is a good time for us. Yeah. And uh, students will be able to find jobs. <coughs> so the prospect of quantum mechanical modeling in biology or your quantum protonics is new. You send me one of those papers, people suggested that. And we are already sort of getting close to it. <coughs> so far, the calculation of ocean on the ground state of the nanoscale molecules surrounded the invector and zero temperature. So even though we claim we are doing quantum mechanical calculation, but those are all the ground states and for the zero temperature. And uh, more sophisticated models and the proper simulation schemes must be introduced. The most important thing is to realize that no single method can comprehensively interpret the phenomenon related to this most uh, complicated thing uh, in the world. You know, life is the most complicated thing. And, uh, you cannot have a single method, a single scheme to, to do that. You know? So this is uh, an uh, uh, era that uh, we all appreciate they have the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to conclude that it's uh, the outlook for the future is uh, what should we do? What is the reason we are here? Okay. So how, how to fit this into uh, the, the DOE uh, long range interaction project? It's very important. So, it looks like our team, uh, the UMKC team, the most important thing is the optical properties calculation. Okay. And uh, as I already mentioned, we need to proper calibration of the optical spectra. We need to study the effect of water, solvents, and uh, other fluids because we are doing a dry thing, which has nothing uh, related to the real stuff. And then we need to try the other models, you know, which can be done much easier, the, so, the, so the lambda DNA is where your, your base pairs are not just the A or AT or OCG, they also can be sort of lambda only mixed, uh, uh, mixed base pairs, and there could be other models of the DNA, which we can certainly try. So this is a topic 
that the uh, area is very interesting. We are all very anxious. Need to account for the many body interactions and as excitonic effects in the optical excitation. This is a big challenge. I have no way knowing how it can be accounted for such complex systems. And, uh, but you know, we can always find some solutions to some difficult problems. So we need to cross a couple of experiments like uh, what we call Adrian is doing and uh, with the other team members. And uh, which area of topic can be make the biggest thing? We cannot try to claim we can solve all the problems. Or we can solve one problem 100% accurate. These are not, in, not possible, and, uh, at least uh, in the near future. So the important thing is that we have to pick which area or which topic which we can make the biggest impact in the next few years. So uh, with this, I wanted to conclude, and uh, I wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, you know, the members of my research group, uh, many collaborators, including uh, this team here, and in particular, uh, Professor Richie Oya and Professor Paul Lewis. Uh, they are my former students, uh, which contributed to quite a bit of work uh, at present here. And Natalia, uh, who graduated last year. And, uh, so thank you very much.